Um, I'm going to talk to you today, not necessarily about my own experience with Lyme disease, but really what's going on in nature and why we were actually talking about Lyme disease at all. Because if you pay attention to the media at all, um, you'll know that in the last few years, there's been a lot of conversation about Lyme disease, and we didn't have those conversations 10 years ago. And I'm going to talk about why we're even talking about Lyme disease right now. Uh, back in the early 90s, um, we didn't actually have Lyme-infected ticks uh, in this country. And somewhere around 1991, 1992, the first breeding population of infected ticks uh, was found on the north shore of Lake Erie, and we didn't get another uh, pocket of these breeding ticks until early 2000s they started to turn up, and we had two. So in the space of that first decade, we had double space, uh, double number of breeding populations of ticks. Um, but then something happened. Uh, global warming is part of hap what happened. Uh, bird migration patterns is another part of what happened. And there were several other factors that got together where it ramped up the degree of infestation of these Lyme-infected ticks in Canada. So as of 2010, 18% of Canadians were living in areas uh, where there were these breeding populations of infected ticks. And it's estimated by Canadian scientists that by uh, 2020, so just five years from now, that that's going to be 80% of Canadians who are going to be living in this area. So I'm going to talk a bit about what's going on there. So we have really three populations of ticks in the United States that are causing all the problems that are coming up into Canada. And one population is in the New England states. They've got pretty much an epidemic going on right there, right now. And those ticks from that area are coming up into Canada, into Ontario, Quebec, and up into Maritimes. That is where we have traditionally in this country seen most of the pockets of breeding uh, infected ticks. Um, that is the area that has been hardest hit, and that is the area that's going to continue to be uh, hardest hit for the foreseeable future. At this point, pretty much all of southern Ontario, uh, southern Quebec, and into the Maritimes are endemic for Lyme disease. And we've now seen that these tick infestations um, are going up over the top of Lake Superior into northern Ontario. Um, and it's estimated by research scientists that from the point that um, ticks be start to invade an area, it's about five years before Lyme disease really becomes endemic in that area. So that's something that's very much coming to northern Ontario, uh, but that is what's happening on the East Coast. Now there is another endemic population of infected ticks that live in the American uh, Midwest, and that group of ticks is moving up into central Canada. Right now what we're seeing is Manitoba, um, very often what is happening is that uh, public health officials there are having to rewrite the map over and over again because they're getting so many ticks coming up from the Midwestern United States that we're starting to see the infestations moving up into Manitoba and then Alberta and Saskatchewan, two provinces where traditionally there have been low to no Lyme disease cases, then they're starting to get hit. And Unlike Ontario, Quebec, and Maritimes, where there's that five-year lag time between the time you see these infected ticks come into an area um, and Lyme disease becoming endemic in those areas uh, because of the stage um, of the ticks that are being brought in from the Midwest, you're really looking at a three-year lag time. Um, so it's going to happen much quicker. It's, we're going to get more infested areas much quicker in the middle of our country um, than was what was happening in the east. But since we don't live in those areas, there is what's in, of interest to us is what's happening really in California. And that's where the other uh, group of infected ticks is. It's in California and it's migrating north up into Canada. So when we talk about 18% of Canadians living in endemic areas, um, back in 2010, going all the way up to 80% by 2020. Um, that is an extraordinarily quick rise in the number of endemic areas uh, in Canada. Uh, we're not going to see quite uh, that extraordinary rise here in British Columbia, and there's a number of reasons why that's not going to happen. But one reason is that most uh, 
people in British Columbia already live in Lyme infested areas. And unfortunately, most people don't know that they live in those areas. Um, so the areas where they found these breeding colonies of infected ticks in British Columbia include Vancouver and the Lower Mainland, uh, the Sunshine Coast, the Fraser Valley, the Kootenays, Haida Gwaii, um, out on the island of Vancouver Island. And coming online right now, we're looking at uh, possibility in the Okanagan Valley and even the Gulf Islands are starting to see what appears to be infestations there. And so what's interesting is that most people who live in areas that are endemic for Lyme disease do not actually know that they are living in areas that are endemic for Lyme disease. Here where we're standing right now, this is an area that is endemic for Lyme disease, uh, Vancouver as well. Um, we have a slightly different situation here in the rest of Canada in that if you're anywhere in Canada east of the Rockies, the vector for Lyme disease is a tick called the black-legged tick. It is Ixodes scapularis, whereas what we're looking at over here is a tick called Ixodes pacificus or the western black-legged tick. So we have an absolutely different tick that is driving infections in this area. And those ticks are coming up from California, but we do have the breeding populations here now. Um, it is estimated by Canadian scientists that up to 175 million ticks are brought into the country every year from the United States. Uh, only a small percentage of those ticks are infected with Lyme disease, but that small percentage still adds up to millions of ticks coming in every year. And that is in addition to the breeding populations that we already have in Canada. And so year over year, it's expected that it's going to rise. Uh, the, the number of endemic areas expected that it's going to rise. And in British Columbia, what we're looking at is the southern valleys of the interior, the um, areas that are endemic for Lyme disease, they're going to keep spreading north and they're going to spread east and west along the sides of these valleys. Uh, here in the lower mainland, it is just going to keep spreading north. So the way we keep track of ticks in British Columbia and throughout the rest of Canada as well. The primary way is something known as passive surveillance. And what passive surveillance is, is when somebody pulls a tick off of a dog or a human being, veterinarians are really good at this or medical doctors can do it as well. Really anybody who's allowed to send these ticks in. When they pull these ticks off people, they send the ticks into, or they can send the ticks into the BC CDC and they can have them tested to see if they are, have Lyme disease. And when they start to see a spike in the number of infected ticks that they are seeing, they do something called active surveillance. So if, for instance, you're looking at an area where there has not actually been uh, these Lyme infected ticks found, but all of a sudden you're getting a bunch of these ticks coming in from veterinarians, from medical doctors, from people who work in forestry, wherever you're getting them from. When you start seeing that spike, um, that's when they start sending in the field researchers to do field research. And there they collect the ticks in nature. Um, they look at, they collect mice and collect blood from those mice to see if they can find it in there. And of course, dogs are considered to be sentinel species for Lyme disease. So you're going to see a spike in Lyme disease in the canine population before you see that spike in the human population. So when the active researchers go out there, then they find these new areas, then we know a little bit more about where Lyme disease in Canada, uh, in British Columbia is. Um, we don't do a whole lot of tick research in British Columbia. 2007 was the last time there was a major uh, active research project. Overall, since the early 90s, about 174 sites in British Columbia um, have been found to be endemic for Lyme disease. Um, there is a research project that's going on right now that is funded by the BC CDC, and that is looking at 11 sites throughout, the BC, throughout British Columbia. The majority of those sites are in the lower mainland area, but also out on the island, also some sites in the interior. And they're looking to see what has changed. So there we've got this lap of time between 2007 and 2013, and it's thought that there's probably been a lot of change in that time, but until they send the researchers out to the field to take a look at what's going on in nature, they don't really know 
all that much. And so that's what's going on right now. That's a two-year project started in 2013. It's going through to 2015. And so hopefully in the very near future, we are going to hear some reporting on that. And that's going to tell us certain things. It's going to tell us uh, particularly what the saturation rates are in ticks. So it's going to tell us uh, not just whether the ticks are there, but what percentage of those ticks carry Lyme disease. And that is an important metric uh, for us to have. Um, when we talk about Lyme disease, um, I have found that often people think of Lyme disease as something that you get out there, out in nature, out in the wilderness, that as long as you don't go camping or hiking out in backcountry, that chances are you're not going to get Lyme disease. Well, there's been some interesting research that's gone into urban and suburban uh, Lyme infection rates. And it's something that's very important to hear us here in British Columbia because British Columbia is unique in Canada in that Lyme disease has always been an urban and suburban disease. Um, most of the Lyme infected ticks have been found in the heavily populated areas of British Columbia. Uh, that's not going to change anytime soon. And so, that's what uh, we need to look at is what does that mean when you live in an area that has Lyme disease and what does that do with your chances of contracting Lyme disease? And so one of the research studies, actually there's been a few research studies have come out that have looked at this topic. And in the urban and suburban areas, they're finding some interesting things. The density has no impact on whether you're going to contract Lyme disease. And by density, what I mean is the number of buildings in an area, the number of people in an area really has no impact on whether you're going to have a good chance of getting Lyme disease or a poor chance of getting Lyme disease. What has the greater factor is wood lots pushed up against herbaceous plants. And the more areas you have in an urban and suburban environment where you have these woodlots pressed up against uh, herbaceous plants, that is a major factor. And size does matter. And when I say size matters, it doesn't necessarily matter in the way you think it might matter. And that is if you have a park that's, say, a, a square kilometer in size, you're less likely to get Lyme in that area than if you had half a dozen parks closely spaced together. Uh, that had that have the same um, square kilometers. Um, the more areas that you have where you have these pockets of fragmentation where you've got your woodland up against um, your herbaceous uh, plants, that is where you're most likely. So it's the perception of most people that you're going to have to go out into the wilderness to contract Lyme disease. But what these scientists are finding when they're doing the research is that you have less chance of contracting Lyme disease in a forest than you do in an urban woodlot. And you have less, and, sorry, yeah, you have less chance of doing it there, and you have a far greater chance of contracting Lyme disease if you're standing in long grass next to a woodlot in an urban area. So it almost upends what we think would logically be the case. We would think that the most dangerous place to go is in the forest, but actually going out into a forest is not so bad. More dangerous is standing in a wooded area in urban and suburban areas, or standing in grassy areas, or even in your own perennial gardens, that can be quite a tricky place for you to be. And so we're talking about golf clubs, we're talking about botanical gardens, we're talking about city parks, we're talking about schoolyards and playgrounds and your own backyards. Those are the areas where you are most likely to pick up a Lyme disease infection. And so that kind of upends what we would think logically would be the case. And so one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, what are the chances that you're going to contract Lyme disease? Uh, because with the growing rates of Lyme disease, obviously it's something that we need to look at. You know, back in 2007 when I was diagnosed with Lyme disease, it came as a huge surprise to me. I live in the Kootenai region. I did not know that we had Lyme disease in Canada. I did not know that. Uh, we had it in British Columbia, and my property, which is woodlot pressed up against grassy areas, I did not know I was living in an area that was the prime area for picking up a Lyme disease infection. And certainly, it was something that came as a surprise, not to me, but it came as a surprise to doctors and public health officials that I turned up with Lyme disease 
because in Creston, I was the first person in Creston's history ever to have a confirmed case of Lyme disease. So it's not something anybody expected was going to happen. Um, and so when we're talking about prevention of Lyme disease, because Lyme disease is actually a fairly easily preventable disease, uh, one thing we have to look at is what are your chances of contracting Lyme disease? And the way they stated um, is low but real. So the most common tick that we actually have here in British Columbia is the dermacenter tick, uh, which is also known as the dog tick. And when we think of ticks, that is the tick we most commonly think of. It's one of the larger ticks, and it's the ticks you're most likely to get on you when you go out into nature. But it's not known to spread Lyme disease. It's these western black-legged ticks that spread Lyme disease. And Exodes pacificus, and to a certain extent also Exodes angustus, they are very tiny ticks. Uh, in the immature stage, the ticks are about the size of a poppy seed. Uh, in their mature stage, the adults are about the size of a sesame seed. Uh, the ticks that are most likely to confer infection into a human being are these immature stage. So when you're looking for ticks that are going to get you and give you Lyme disease, you're looking at something that is the size of a poppy seed. Uh, very tiny ticks indeed, and once they attach to you, they do, when they suck your blood, they do blow up to about the size of a raisin. So the longer they're attached to you, the more likely you are to see one. Um, so if you find yourself, um, you have got a tick on you, chances are the tick you got on you is a dog tick. It cannot confer Lyme disease to you. Um, if you happen to get one of the small poppy seed sized western black legged ticks on you uh, out in nature, very few of them are actually infected with Lyme disease. So I think it's less than 5% at this point of that particular specific kind of tick has Lyme disease. So even if you get one of these ticks on you, if that tick attaches to you and starts sucking blood, um, chances are it doesn't have Lyme disease. So nobody panic out there that you're going to get Lyme disease just because you got a tick on you. Uh, and there's a very important thing you need to know about ticks, and that is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, something called Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, that is a bacteria that has been designed over time to live in different creatures with very different immune systems. So the immune system in a mouse, which is the reservoir for Lyme disease, uh, mice and small rodents, um, that is a very different environment than what exists in ticks. And the immune system that exists in human beings is very different indeed. And so when a tick uh, bites you and the bacteria is moving from that tick into your body, there is a genetic strategy that has to change for it to go from being able to survive in that tick's body to surviving in your body. And what that means for you in practical terms is if a tick does attach to you, if it's a black-legged tick, if it's infected with Lyme disease, if you remove that tick from your body within 24 hours of that tick attaching to you, then you have a very good chance that you will not contract Lyme disease. So it is possible to contract Lyme disease in less than 24 hours of an infected tick attaching to you, but it's quite rare. And if you look at the chart, it sort of falls off a cliff uh, below the 24 hour uh, point. So one of the things that we need to do in British Columbia, since pretty much everybody in this room is probably living in endemic area, is we have to recognize what that risk is. It is a low risk, yes, and Lyme disease is something that you can very easily avoid if you do something very simple, and that is a tick check. We haven't traditionally done that. Um, we haven't been taught how to do that because 20 years ago, Lyme disease was not a factor in our lives. Uh, Lyme disease is now a factor in our life, and as we move forward into the future, more and more ticks are gonna become infected. The saturation levels, so the percentage of ticks out in nature are going to become, that are infected are gonna go up and up and up. And that's partially because we have these breeding populations here in British Columbia right now. But it's partly also because of what's going on in California. So for a long time, it was thought that California of the three different zones where we have ticks uh, breeding happily, um, and prolifically in the United States, that California was the lesser evil, which was great news for us up here in British Columbia. Um, one bird can carry a tick up to 425 kilometers uh, 
each time they migrate. And so slowly that march is coming up here in British Columbia. And if there's no infected ticks in California, if there is a minor amount of infected ticks in California, then that's fantastic news for us. Uh, but what they've been finding in recent years is what they thought to be true about uh, ticks in nature and infections in those ticks in California turned out not to be true. Um, there are many more ticks in California in many more areas than they thought that they were originally there. And the percentage of those ticks is much, uh, that are infected with Lyme disease are much higher than what they originally thought. And that research is very active research, is coming online you know, almost weekly. You're seeing something coming out about it. And so that's what we're looking at here in British Columbia is Right now, our risk for Lyme disease is fairly low. If we were all to do start doing tick checks right now, then Lyme disease is an easily avoidable disease. You won't have to worry about ever contracting it. And tick checks are really simple. There is this idea that ticks actually drop down from trees. They don't do that. Um, ticks are designed to grab onto small mammals. To deer is pretty much the tallest animal it goes after besides us, but they're they feed on about 300 different kinds of species of small uh, mammals, rodents, everything from dogs to raccoons to possums to squirrels to mice. So they never actually go any higher than about this. They're really famous for hanging on to the ends of blades of grass. They hang on to shrubbery and bush. They love your perennial borders. That's where they like to go. And of course, the problem with ticks is um, we have the perfect weather out here for ticks. They love moist and they love cool. Um, so that is a problem for us. Three, uh, three quarters of all tick species in Canada are found out here on the coast in British Columbia because we have the perfect weather for them. It is very hard to freeze a tick to death. Uh, they survive very well out here. Canadian researchers have frozen ticks down to minus 10 degrees Celsius, and when they've warmed those ticks back up again, once they hit zero degrees, one degrees, two degrees, they pop back to life. Um, and that 10 degrees, um, I'm not talking air temperature, I'm talking the temperature of the tick itself. Ticks don't just stand out there in the environment in winter and wait for the cold to freeze them. They go into leaf litter, they go into mulches, they go into soil, they attach themselves to mammals and to rodents, and that's how they overwinter. And so for a tick to get down to minus 10 degrees Celsius, the air temperature has to get significantly cooler than that. Well, we know we don't often get those temperatures uh, here in British Columbia, particularly in the southern regions, the southern valleys, and out here on the coast. We just don't get those temperatures. So the ticks here are thriving because we're giving them absolutely the perfect environment to thrive in. Nature did that. We didn't do that. Nature did that very well. Um, and they're going to continue thriving because We've got global warming coming our way, um, you know, as much as we'd like to pretend it's not coming our way, um, it is, and it is driving this farther and farther north. As our temperatures get milder, you know, not only is it hard to freeze a tick to death, it's kind of hard to heat a tick to death either. Uh, they desiccate very easily, so in dry temperatures, um, desert-like conditions, uh, they too tend to dry out and die. But they've heated them up to 35 degrees, sometimes a little bit more than 35 degrees, and still these ticks just keep on going. And so we, we don't have those extremes of temperature out here on the coast. We don't get down to minus 10 degrees and below. We don't get up to 35 degrees and above. So ticks are going to continue to thrive here. And those tick checks I'm talking about, you start at the bottom. You do it, do it once a day, because remember, 24 hours, if you can get that tick off you within 24 hours of it attaching, even if it's infected, you're not likely to get Lyme disease, which is what makes Lyme disease so avoidable. Um, you start down low because ticks grab on low and then they start crawling up your body. So you really want to get them when they're down low. Uh, they tend to navigate to the furry areas of your body. So they like the groin, they like the armpit, they love the base of your skull. They love to get up under the hairline. And that's why people tend to think that they drop down from trees because they often find them in their hair. But they didn't get that way from above, they got that way from below. They like belly buttons as well, they really like that. So you have to get really intimate with yourself once a day, just before you get in the shower or as you're getting a shower. 
Um, if a tick has not actually attached to you, you can shower it off very easy. If it has attached to you, then you need to remove it with tweezers. You can find all sorts of uh, directions for removing t uh, ticks online. Some of them are quite complicated, and I don't know about you, whenever I get a tick on me that I've got to pull off, my hands are usually shaking, so I use the simplest method possible. The simplest method possible is sharp-ended tweezers. The flat-ended tweezers, uh, because ticks you need to pull them out by the head, so you need to be able to get that tweezer into your skin because they're locking themselves into your skin. Uh, the pointy ones are much easier to stab into your skin and pull it out by the head. <laughs> it sounds funny, but if you actually grab a tick by its guts and squish it, uh, if it's got infection in its body, it's going to squish that infection right into you. So you do want to grab it by the head. And even as I've said that, if you're somebody who's actually had to take one of these immature ticks off of you, you know how hard that is. I was doing it a few weeks ago. I got, was getting firewood and I was wearing a long sleeve and I didn't realize that I'd gotten a tick on me. And so it had embedded in my wrist. And remember, we're talking about something the size of a poppy seed. And the recommendation is grab the poppy seed that's embedded in your skin by the head and pull it out. I, I defy anybody to find the head of something that small, but that is what you need to do is just give it your best shot. I gave it my best shot. I didn't have any symptoms afterwards, so yay, I got away with that one. But when it comes to Lyme disease, um, we need to look at it as a very complex and diverse disease. Um, when you pull that tick off of your body, in the days and the weeks after that, what you're looking for is any symptom, any change in your health to the negative. That's what you're really looking for. For a long time, and to a certain extent now, there's a lot of focus on Lyme disease starts with a tick bite, followed by a rash, followed by flu-like symptoms. That's great if that happens, but that doesn't happen all the time. The vast majority of people who have Lyme disease have no recollection of a tick bite. I have no recollection of a tick bite. Um, and the percentage of people who develop a rash, we don't actually know what that is uh, in this country right now. You'll often see on um, public health sites, and certainly when I started researching back in 2007, it'll say something like 80% of people with Lyme disease develop a circular rash, an expanding circular rash that sometimes looks like a bullseye and sometimes does not. Um, that data is actually coming out of the United States, out of endemic zones in the United States. We don't know how well it applies up here in Canada. Uh, what we do know is that Canadians appear to be developing one of these rashes at a far lower rate than that, 80%. So if you go and look at the Public Health Agencies of Canada's website right now, if you look at several of the websites of other health agencies in this country, you'll find that that percentage is starting to drop as Canadian data is being worked in and as we realize that maybe a lot of people are not developing rashes and possibly not even the flu-like symptoms. Certainly in my case, I did not develop any first stage symptoms at all. I didn't, I don't remember a tick bite. I don't, did not develop a rash. I did not develop flu-like symptoms. So that for people who suffer stage three Lyme disease, the neurological form of Lyme disease, uh, it's very common that they had no first stage symptoms. So what you're looking for are what we classically identify, I should say, as first stage symptoms. So it is good to look for those symptoms. It is if you're bitten by a tick, if you've removed that tick, look for the rash, uh, look for the flu-like symptoms. Look for anything else, uh, any change, because sometimes the changes are not obvious. And of course, that's one of the things that makes Lyme disease so hard to diagnose. Um, you'll hear a lot in the media about how, how people went many months, many years without diagnosis. That's because we're talking about a very diverse disease that often looks like other diseases. Um, most of its symptoms are what are known as nonspecific symptoms. Um, which are things like fatigue, um, their muscle and joint pain, um, their runny noses, their fevers. Um, they're not symptoms that are really easy for doctors to say, ah, yes, that's Lyme disease. But your gardeners, uh, your gardeners in British Columbia, which means you're out in nature a lot of the time. And worse than that, what do gardeners do in the spring and the fall? But we go into our gardens. Um, if you read the public health recommendations, they will say specifically, don't do that in the spring and the fall. You know, you want to stay on paths, you want to stay on driveways, you want to stay on concrete, you do not want to go in your gardens. We're all in our gardens in spring. I mean, when else are you supposed, you're not going to be dividing your plants in August, you're not going to be moving your plants in August. You're out there in the worst time. When all the ticks are in your garden, you're in your garden. 
Okay, so that's something that you need to know as a gardener is that you're actually amongst the people most likely to contract Lyme disease. So just by the fact that you're a gardener, just by the fact that you have the kind of tendencies you have, uh, you're putting yourself ahead of many other British Columbias in the chances of you contracting Lyme disease. So back in 2007 when I contracted, Lyme, when I was diagnosed with Lyme disease, we don't actually know for certain when I contracted it. Um, it was a shocker. It was a shocker for me. It was a shocker for the doctors. It was a shocker for the public health officials that somebody in Creston would turn up with this oddball disease um, that they don't really associate too much with that area. Although the Kootenays are endemic for Lyme disease, they're not endemic for Lyme disease in the way that the lower mainland is endemic for it. Much higher chance of contracting it here than you are contracting it in the Kootenays. Um, so you know a lot more than I did. You know that it's coming, it's gonna be big, um, the saturation rates are gonna go up, so year over year, the expectation is more and more ticks in these breeding populations are going to have Lyme disease. More and more of these breeding populations are going to be found in the areas of British Columbia where the majority of British Columbians live, and year over year, your chances of contracting Lyme disease are going to go up, but if you start today and do those tick checks that I'm talking about, then your chance, your personal chance of contracting Lyme disease is going to go down to almost nil. Okay, so I see that I'm about to get the hook. So I'm going to, I'm going to let her hook me uh, and I'm going to stay around for a little while and answer questions because Lyme disease is such a huge, huge topic. You can only actually cover the tiniest amount of it uh, in half an hour. And of course, being gardeners, we're interested in the nature part of it. Um, but individuals are often uh, interested in other parts of it as well. So if anybody has any questions about Lyme disease, either my case of Lyme disease, Lyme disease in general, because I've talked to at this point more than 200 Lyme disease patients in Canada, I can talk generally about it or specifically about my experience. Or if you're interested in what's going on in nature, you know, please just come and talk to me. I'm gonna be around here for a little while. And uh, you can ask me any question you like. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.